um, but it was just kind of a, an orientation. So we still have room for um, more folks. Um, we have a good crowd, got five people, a nice group, um, but we, if you're still interested or know someone who might be, let me know because we do have um, room for um, one or two more. Um, I want to remind you about the Northwest Ohio Prayer Dinner on May 4th. Um, the guest speaker there is Alan Duck Dynasty. Robertson, thank you. Um, and he will, um, he will be speaking after dinner. Um, at, I believe it's 7 o'clock. I still have five seats left. So it's $12.00. It's a very good deal for $12. So if you're interested, please let me know. Um, our spring Bible study this, this year is going to be called Overcoming Spiritual Slump. I do have the books for that. We're going to be starting on April 24th. That's tomorrow. Um, in person at 2 o'clock. Um, Wednesday, we have a 2 o'clock Zoom session. The Wednesday 6.30 class is going to be a week later so it won't start on the 26th it'll start on the 3rd of may um, because the um wednesday night class is dragging its feet finishing up the other no i'm kidding there um but we will have to wait an extra week so if you're going to come on wednesday evening you won't come this week you'll come the following week but monday and wednesday afternoon of this week i think um be five sessions one hour sessions I um, want to remind you, uh, we're having a work day next week after church here at Hope. This is a great opportunity to um, serve your church. You can come. Um, we have a list of just kind of cleaning, light maintenance type stuff that um, needs to be done. And we have a huge list. So if everybody shows up, I promise you, you will have a job. Um, and we have things that um, can be done by all ages, um, skill levels. So um, please feel free. We're going to um, have some lunch for you immediately after worship, and then we'll get started. Um, I also want to remind you today, from noon to one, Hands of Hope will be going out to, and that's you, by the way, um, will be going out to help clean up. There's a field right across from Kroger, right across um, Prey um, from Kroger, and if you ever drive by there, you know that it's always full of trash and everything else. So Rebel Chiropractic is kind of leading the charge to get that cleaned up. So um, they could use all the help they could get. Um, and I believe that's all I have today. So let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
Now, if you'll join me and uh, call responsibly to the call of worship. God shows no partiality. No race or group is shown special advantage. In every nation, anyone who respects God and who does what is right is acceptable to the Lord. You know the message God sent to all through the people of Israel. It is a message of peace by Jesus Christ who has made Lord of all. And now the children are dismissed for Sunday school. of our daily lives, from the hubbub of our work and play, from the hue and cry of the world around us. We come to worship you. In this hour, we long to meet you, to feel your presence surrounding us, enveloping us, loving us. We long to settle into silence, 
laying aside our worries and our cares, aware of our presence around us, before us, behind us, within us. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now our first hymn is Rock of Ages, pages 361. I think it's in your hymnal or your um, bulletin also. If you'll join me with the affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We, we live in God's, God's world. world. We, we believe in God, God who has created and is creating, who has, has come to Jesus, Jesus, the Word made flesh, flesh, to reconcile and make you, to work in us and others by the Spirit. We trust God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve our members. To seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the floor. morning is from Acts verses 10, 1, verse, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 17 and verses 34 through 48. At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and his all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, 
he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel spoke to him, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was the one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became angry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being sent down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice, the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. And now verses 40, 34 through 48. Then Peter began to speak, I know, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. You know, that, you know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one from whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness and of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard him speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of the Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
Last week, the errand that nearly cost Ralph Yarl his life was the sort of errand that falls to older siblings everywhere. Ralph, a black 16-year-old in Kansas City, Missouri, had been sent to pick up his younger twin siblings at a friend's house on Thursday evening, but he mixed up the address. Finding himself in front of a house on Northeast 115th Street instead of Northeast 115th Terrace. The 84-year-old man who answered the door shot Ralph in the head and again in the arm after he had fallen and before the man had identified who this boy was on his front steps. Somehow, Ralph made his way bleeding to another nearby house, and there he was told to lie on the ground while someone called for help. Last weekend, a 20-year-old woman was shot and killed after she and three friends accidentally turned into the wrong driveway while looking for a friend's house in rural upstate New York, going to a party. As they were backing out of the wrong driveway, Kaylin Gillis, a passenger in the vehicle, was shot by a 65-year-old man who fired two shots from his front porch. In Texas, a 25-year-old man shot, shot two cheerleaders who were on their way home from practice when one of the girls accidentally tried to get into the wrong car. They had already gone back to their car, and as he approached them, they rolled down the window to apologize for the mistake, and he fired into the car. Let's pray. God, our hearts are broken. Families mourn and children live in fear. And our disconnection and alienation has caused some in fear to turn to guns for protection and safety. We ask that you touch our hearts with your love, heal our brokenness, and turn us away from violence towards peace. Help us to transform our own hearts, create in us clean hearts, so that we might seek peaceful ways of resolving our differences. Let our hands reach out and connect with those who feel alone and those who live in fear. And this morning, let your Holy Spirit speak to us a message of faith rather than fear. A faith that reaches out to others, offering hope and good news. We ask this in the name of the God who desires that we live together in peace. Amen. At Caesarea in Philippi, there was a man named Cornelius, a soldier in the Italian regiment. He was a good man who prayed to God and gave money to the poor, but he was not a Jew. God's Holy Spirit helped Peter understand that his ministry was not just to the Jews. Peter came to understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to the Lord. The idea that God has chosen a particular people as the object of special regard cultivates a dangerous suspicion that God did not, therefore, choose others. Those believers who think themselves among God's elect are often inclined on this theological basis to think that God has not chosen anyone else who disagrees with their beliefs or customs. Yes, brothers and sisters in Christ, we can all be guilty of xenophobia. Xenophobia is the fear or dislike of anything which is perceived as being foreign or strange. It's an expression which is based on the perception that a conflict exists between an in-group and an out-group, and it may manifest itself in suspicion of, one's groups, of one group's activities by members of the other group, a desire to eliminate the presence of the other group, which is the target of suspicion, and the fear of losing some sense of identity, whether it's national, ethnic, or racial. We pin labels on our disagreeable opponents to disenfranchise them. They are liberal or conservative, Jewish or Muslim, female or laity or black or divorced or homosexual or trans. Yet what has become crystal clear to Peter in this text is that, that to do so is not the prerogative of pious Israel or anyone else. God alone judge, judges the living and the dead. 
God alone judges judges the living and the dead that's verse 42 in our text perhaps the most surprising feature of the acts of the apostles this book that comes after the gospels is the diversity of people that God calls to be included among God's people all of whom are symbolized by this man Cornelius this uncircumcised Gentile man is symbolic of all people who are not Jewish God's pastoral project in the story is to bring us into an understanding of God's will so that we may better collaborate with God in the work of salvation. The conversion of Cornelius takes Peter by surprise, but not because God decides at the last moment to save an uncircumcised Gentile. In fact, the universal embrace of divine love was promised to Abraham and prophesied by Scripture long before Cornelius was saved. Yet, for all of his spiritual authority as one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, Peter still didn't get it. His religious parochialism prompted him to divide people into clean, repentant Jews and unclean, uncircumcised Gentiles. God's redemptive purpose for Gentiles could not be realized unless the apostle had a change of mind and heart. Even though Peter's case is exceptional, it also exemplifies two important elements in finding God's will for our lives. First of all, we learn God's will from God rather than from our own resources. The Lord is not a passive bystander or a disinterested partner, but is committed to a process of disclosure by which God's will is given to us. In fact, the urgency of this matters, indicated by the repetition of Peter's vision three times, which discloses something new to him about God's redemptive will that he otherwise would not have known on his own. Secondly, we typically learn God's will over time, through a series of aha moments. Peter's vision initially baffled him. Peter's understanding of his Gentile mission of of how it was unfolding as a result of these visions was based on some internal reflection and through the report of others and by Cornelius who was giving him a hospitable reception when he came to him to speak God's word to him. Peter turned to scripture for confirmation and clarification only after he had learned by multiple experiences over several days that God's forgiveness is offered to all people without partiality. We live in a society that promises instant reward for self-sufficient people who know with certainty the way forward, who have all the answers, rather than people who doubt and have questions and humility. These cultural values collide with a practical aim of Christian faith to know and act upon the will of God. The process of getting on the same page with God is frequently confusing, profoundly dependent upon others in community, and often takes a considerable amount of time. We Methodists rely on what we call the Wesleyan quadrilateral. We rely on scripture, tradition, reason, and experience to know the will of God. In the Acts of the Apostles, this book, God's word often takes the form of a surprising phenomenon rather than a biblical text, like the vision that Peter has three times. In fact, one testimony of God's new direction is asked for in Acts, and the apostle typically cites a saving event before a sacred text. Scripture has to be read through the lens of experience. For all our proper attention to careful Bible study, and we do believe in careful Bible study, God's prodding of us is often felt within us or first observed in the bustle of life around us. Often, our opinion is reversed, for the Lord's sake, by our existential encounters with the Holy Spirit in the mess and muck of ordinary living. Thank God. Xenophobia is wrong for a Christian. Genesis makes it evident that God is the creator of all people and that each of us is made in his image. That's Genesis 1.27. 
And if you remember in Genesis 1.28, right after that, he instructs Adam and Eve to be fruitful and increase in number, and then gave that same instruction to Noah after the flood in Genesis 9. It was God who scattered the people after the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, effectively creating a situation in which there will always be those who are foreign to us. Do you understand that? It's by God's doing that God spread the people out from the Tower of Babel so that there would always be people who spoke a language not like ours, who would always be foreign to us. And yet God, throughout the Old Testament, talks about welcoming the stranger, for we were strangers once. Clearly, sin has damaged humanity, but the Bible nowhere indicates that one nationality or ethnic group is superior to another. In fact, it says in Romans 3, 22 and 23, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Turn to Revelations chapter 5, chapter 7, and you'll read twice that heaven will include people from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. The New Testament makes this, this God's saving of the Gentiles patently obvious. What's our favorite Bible verse in all, all the Bible, right? The one we learned in vacation Bible school as kids. For God so loved the world, the world, the whole world, that he sent his son. John three sixteen. Turn over to Galatians, the letter to the... The church in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 and this is what was written to the believers there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither free nor slave there is no male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the same promise God does not call us to hate and fear people who are different from us that kind of thinking is antithetical to the Christian message that says to embrace and offer hospitality to the stranger because you once were the stranger. Nothing overcomes fear and counters xenophobia better than the Great Commission. Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. That's Matthew 28, 19. Nothing overcomes fear and better than the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. Amen? Amen. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we are friends to one another, not because we are so lovable and endearing, or because we choose to be with people who are like ourselves, but because you want us, as your children, to reach out with the best of other people, whoever they are and whatever their characteristics. You want your friends to enjoy a rich and healthy diet of love and joy, peace and patience, kindness and goodness. Thank you for making us your friends and friends to one another. By your Holy Spirit, feed our faith on Jesus the Christ so that we grow stronger in our living concern for other people. Strengthen our faith so that Christ may live in us, so that we may live to please you rather than try to please the world, and so that our priorities are yours and not the greedy and selfless priorities of our society. Give your wisdom to whom? To those who govern us so that all the people in local country can live in peace and safety. Inspire the leaders of the Christian denominations so that Jesus is honored among all sections of society. We marvel how your spirit takes Jesus to the outsiders, those who belong to small or rejected groups in our society. May we welcome them as one with us, lovingly wash us all clean and sow the risen Christ like a new seed to sprout and grow in our lives. Now we come as your friends and beseech you, refresh those who are tired, heal those who are sick, and encourage those who are new. We thank you for hearing us through our Jesus, our risen Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. is 
of all nations, you made it clear that all people are invited to partake of the glory of your salvation. Help us to invite all people to your goodness so that no one might be forgotten in your saving grace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, in joint hands, we'll have our benediction. Yeah.